Hello, hello, hello. Today is Wednesday, January 17, 2024. Here follow the solutions to the capacitor problem 189. I have chosen the very first correct solution which is by this person. I add quite a bit to his text, which I call a mini lecture. Of course, many of you found out that in lecture seven of 802, I cover exactly what this problem was all about. Now, I also recommend that you watch the very nice vi video by Keith and Bridget. And this is the website. But I suggest you watch this solution the one that I do right now, before you watch Keith's solution, because Keith's solution will then be more useful and easier for you to follow. I have therefore decided that I will post his solution tomorrow. But of course, if you want to see his, it's on this site. You can do it today but I will post it tomorrow. Question A. The electric field on the surface of a conductor is the average of the field above and below it. The magnitude of the electric field on one side is sigma divided by epsilon, which is Q divided by A epsilon. And on the other side, it's zero. Thus the field on the surface is Q divided by 2A epsilon zero. Many of you do not have the factor two. They think, which may be intuitively more pleasing, that, <laughs> that the field is simply Q divided by A epsilon zero. That means sigma epsilon zero, but that is not true. Walter Lewin also mentions this in lecture seven of 802. Therefore, the force that the plates exert on each other is Q square divided by 2A epsilon zero. There is another, maybe even better way to look at this. Look at my lecture three of 802 and go 30 minutes into the lecture. The E field inside the capacitor is sigma divided by epsilon zero, which is Q divided by A epsilon zero. <clears throat> However, half this E field is produced by the bottom plate and the other half by the upper plate. The E field generated by the bottom plate acts on the charge Q in the upper plate and the E field generated by the upper plate acts on the charge Q in the bottom plate. What comes now is very fundamental. Read this carefully. If an object has charge Q with an associated E field 
which is due to that charge, there is no net force on Q. If there were a net force, all charged particles and all charged objects would be accelerated due to their own electric fields. In principle, you would then also be able to design a car which you can drive but which has no engine. There is only a force on Q if there is an external E-field acting on Q. The answer on B is now obvious that the force that you just calculated under A is the force at which the two plates attract each other. The work we have to do to move that force from x to 2x, from x to 2x, thus over a distance x, is that force times that distance. Last question D. The energy stored in a capacitor is Q squared divided by 2C. And for plate capacitors, C is A epsilon zero divided by X. Thus, in the first case, the stored energy is X Q squared divided by 2A epsilon zero. And for the second case, it is twice higher. We expect this as the work we have done is the change in the stored energy in the capacitor. We have created an E-field in an area, in a volume I should say, XA, where there was no E-field before. Now comes something that is perhaps part of my many lecture. I discussed in lecture 7 of 802 that electric fields contain energy. The field energy is the integral over all space of one half epsilon zero e squared dv. V here is volume. Thus, if we have a constant E field, as we have here, and we have that constant E field in a volume AX, then the total electric field energy is X Q squared divided by 2A epsilon zero. But if the volume doubles, the total field energy of obviously also doubles. By separating the plates from x to 2x, we, you or I have created an E-field Q divided by epsilon zero where there was none before. So clearly these energies are stored in the capacitor and I remind you to look again at the questions above under D. Yes, it's true. Physics works.